Uh, I'm Mark Blomquist. I'll be the moderator for the remainder of the session today. Our next presentation is Management of Urea and Urea Sources for Sugar Beet. Dr. Dan Kaiser, University of Minnesota, St. Paul. All right, I wanna start by uh, thanking the research crews at the Southern Beet Sugar and also at the Northwest Research and Outreach Center, which helped with the study and also the R&E board, which uh, for starting to provide funding for which is year one of this particular project where we're looking at managing uh, urea, looking at uh, fall spring applications and um, looking at comparisons of urea sources. And the reasoning behind this is we're in the process in Minnesota right now of updating our the nitrogen best management practices across the state. And one of the practices that we've had um, traditionally in the western part of the state has been acceptable has been fall application of urea. So we know from research on corn that that's getting tougher to recommend. Um, this funding though is to look at sugar beet to see if uh, some of the same things that we're seeing in terms of reduced uh, yield we're seeing in that crop. Um, so I can make some distinctions moving forward since the the BMPs at this point in time don't really um, make a distinction between the two crops when it comes to nitrogen management itself. So urea, what makes it more challenging is um, a few factors. Uh, first, um, it's a neutral molecule, so that means it's water soluble. Uh, the molecule can leach and also can incorporate itself um, without conversion to nitrate. It isn't like some of the other sources that we're really waiting for them to get to nitrate before they're um, effectively they're mobile. And this actually has some issues too in terms of runoff losses too, which we can see some issues with that. It does nitrify quicker and it's subject to volatility. And the volatility issue doesn't stop with cold soil temperatures. And that's one of the things that I see a fair amount of the time we get questions from growers is when we start looking at nitrification, we do know that that slows down once we hit about 50 degrees soil temperature. But urea, since it's a, the hydrolysis process is affected by an enzyme, that process can happen even if the soils are cold. And just an example of that, this is kind of a, a good study to, to show some of this. And this is looking at urea nitrogen loss as ammonium or a volatility of that product on, uh, when applied to frozen ground. And this is actually, I think, barley, uh, where they were looking at uh, winter applications at, of 90 pounds, which you look at the black dots, those are the application timings where they applied 90 pounds either around the 1st of December, um, looking at about the middle of February or just about the middle of April. And what these lines represent are, are ammonium flux. So this essentially is looking at nitrogen loss with or without urea, either with or without a, the MBBT or a product like Agritain, which is a urease inhibitor. So looking at it in terms of application timing, looking at, I just, what I did is I summarized the total loss and that's kind of where that arrow represents is the total loss for each application timings. Looking at over the three timings, a total loss of roughly 30% of the nitrogen in the urea as ammonium, even when the soils are frozen. And this is something that um, another, other studies have shown too, is uh, we can delay the hydrolysis but you can't necessarily stop it. So that's one of the things to think with fall application of urea that we focus many times on the nitrification or the nitrification and the nitrate loss, but it may not necessarily be the biggest factor affecting um, the, the urea loss itself. And that's really what we're trying to look at here. So this trial, um, again, we started this, would have been the fall of 2020 with the first fall applications. Two locations, one in the northern region at Crookston and then one in the southern growing region at Hector. Uh, the trial one, there's actually two trials at each location. The first trial is a, a fairly simple fall spring urea study, so non-treated urea, looking at uh, six to eight nitrogen rates depending on the location. Late fall applications were around November 1st. So we're kind of targeting a point at which we'd hit our soils should stabilize at 50 degrees at the locations, which would be what we'd recommend for an anhydrous or an application of, um, of uh, ammonium form to limit uh, the conversion of nitrate. And then spring within one week of planting. And now the fall applications were generally disked in. Um, so they were really worked in lightly. So we're, we're looking at kind of simulating what you'd probably see with like a vertical till operation, so something we're not looking at an aggressive tillage, which can present some risks in terms of um, shallow incorporation for volatility, but I, I'm not gonna get into that today, but there is some risks with that. Then trial two is a fall spring study uh, where we're looking at nine fertilizer sources and a non-fertilized control applied at 45 pounds. And the reason we use 45 pounds is we wanted a rate of fertilizer that could, we could see an increase in yield, but yet it wasn't at a point where we're at 
our maximum response. We're really trying to look at sorting out between these products. We need to be looking at a suboptimal rate. And I picked 45 pounds just because it's divisible by three, which you'll see why that's important in the moment. And um, everything was replicated four times. So the sources we were using, the source study, 100% um, urea was kind of our, our general comparison. Then we had some splits with ESN where we had 3366 and 100% ESN in combination splits. So again, that's why we use the, the 45 pounds because it's easy, easy to divide that by three. Then the other products we were looking at is at Anvil at 1.5 quarts per ton, which Anvil is a, year, is, um, a urease inhibitor. Agritain, we're using a low rate. Um, actually the rate we applied, I couldn't get the 0.45 to mix properly. So we're close to about one quart per ton, which is about half the the rate that's labeled for that product and the reason i use the low rate essentially is because of super u super u is a combination of dcd and mbpt and the rate in super u is a lower rate it's closer to that essentially equivalent to that 0.45 quarts per ton so essentially what i'm trying to do with the agritain rate is trying to separate out if we see a response to super u what is it is it agritain or is it the dcd and then instinct next gen 24 ounces per acre one thing about instinct that makes it different is that it is a labeled pesticide. There is a supplemental label for root crops though. So beets are included with that. Um, so that's one of the things we had to kind of make sure. And it's a little bit different because that's labeled or it's applied based on a rate per acre, which is a little bit difficult um, because um, essentially you're getting a lower rate per ton as you increase your rate per acre. So it kind of, particularly with lower rates of nitrogen becomes a challenge to mix the product because it gets a little soupy when you're trying to mix it together. And the last one is ammonium sulfate. I wanted an ammonium source, which should have a lower volatility potential than urea itself. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about three things. I'm gonna show the emergence data. This is one of the questions we had last year with some of the nitrogen data, since we we're focusing on a spring urea trial, is looking at um, you know, what was the impact of emergence. So if you look at this study, the, the maroon lines, the points of the fall application, the gold points are the spring application. And I converted these to sugar beet emergence as percent of total instead of plants per 100 foot of row, just to have a comparison between the two locations. Because if you look at the spring applications are roughly consistent, about 200 pounds of nitrogen, we we're looking at you know, roughly a 20 to 30% reduction in emergence. And last year, the data I showed, it showed really no impact in yield. And that's kind of the same thing we saw this year essentially a fairly significant um, decrease in emergence, but essentially that had no impact on yield. In the fall applications, you look at relatively no effect on the emergence of the plant, of the, the sugar beets themselves. So in, in effect, looking at the fall applications being relatively a lot safer when it comes to emergence as a total for beet production. So the source trials are a little bit different. What I do here, I'm just gonna mainly talk, focus on those bullet points on the right. Um, what I did here is I have kind of in darker blue, those are kind of the, the treatments that sorted out near the top. Uh, the red ones are sorted out near the bottom. If you look at the two locations, the site at Crookston, essentially the fertilizer application tended to reduce the, um, the emergence. Now the Crookston site, this is just for spring application. We had an application issue, the fall treatments, we lost those. So, with the source data, the Crookston data, I'm average just for the, the spring treatments, the Hector data is for the, uh, both the fall and spring treatments because that um, application was as planned. And that site actually seeing essentially some increase, but really no consistency other than instinct, which tended to sort itself out near the bottom with, um, with the overall emergence numbers. Yield-wise at the two locations, um, we had a lower average yield at Crookston, averaging closer to 18 tons for the root yield. Um, looking at the data, I mean, if there is, was a response, it was somewhere near about 120 pounds. And this um, on the bottom is looking at applied N plus our four foot soil nitrate N. And on the, the bottom right shows you what those totals were. We're looking at anywhere close to the four foot level around 40 pounds at both locations. Hector um, was closer to around 130. And if the, our Southern site last year, we were closer to about 200 with about 40 ton maximum average. So we saw a, a lower response this last year than we did in um, 2020. Um, you know, what that means, I don't know. I mean, looking at this would be more consistent with what I've expected just based on the recommendation being closer to that 130 um, range for that, that applied N plus total N. So the source trail, you know, you've got to kind of take this with a grain of salt right now. Uh, this is kind of one of the things that we're looking at moving forward and doing additional years of this just to try to look at averaging this across sites because overall looking at 
kind of what tended to be near the top in this, you look at what was near the bottom was urea um, versus the control, super U. And then um, looking at um, our 66% ESN, what was near the top essentially was the majority of the treatments that had a higher rate of either a urease inhibitor or 33% ESN. So will this be the same next year? I don't know. Again, that's why we need additional data, but this is one of the things that I really wanna look at here is we're looking at what's the best option here. Is it a urease inhibitor or is it a nitrification inhibitor? Because we've solely tested for fall application, mostly nitrification inhibitors. And looking at the loss potential, it starts to make me wonder again with some of the shallower incorporation if we're missing something. If um, you're looking at uh, that urease inhibitor may be more important which at least for the Hector site looks like it potentially could be since Anvil was, was kind of up near the top um, along, with ES, along with that 33% ESN. And that 33% ESN is normally what I would kind of suggest for a split if anybody's going to use it. Last year, I mean, I really expected that 100% to be um, closer to the control just because we didn't have water for that product. And that product needs temperature and it needs moisture in the soil to release the nitrogen with it. So higher percent of ESN just wasn't gonna be the thing that was gonna work last year across most locations, particularly with the dry conditions. If you're really wet, it might be a benefit, but these dry conditions, it, it really won't sort out near the top. So for extractable sucrose, um, what I'm summarizing here is pounds per ton. Uh, if you look at the pounds per acre, it followed pretty closely to the yield response. It maximized at hectare um, at slightly less, about 30 to 40 pounds less. Than that, but what I want to really look at here is just um, just the, the pounds per ton here. Just to look at the differences in the two sites, and at Hector, really looking at a high yield situation, but looking at where we really couldn't push any more than about twelve and a half percent for the extractable sucrose at that particular site. Um, with the lower yields, Crookston was quite a bit higher, higher than the fifteen percent uh, range in there. But in both cases, seeing that generally they decreased with increasing rate of N. If you look at the Hector site, I mean, looking at Crookston and Hector, both of them, you know, roughly the highest levels were at, at the lower rates. There wasn't a whole lot of difference at Hector up to about that 120, 130 range. So we're looking at essentially seeing max yield and max there. It went down a little bit, but not as much, um, even though the, the overall trend was for decreasing um, protein and then look, or decreasing um, extractable sucrose. And looking at the fall versus spring, um, the extractable sucrose was 3% higher for the fall application. This was pretty consistent at both locations. So we did see some difference there, but there was no interaction. So the treatments themselves uh, didn't, uh, their, their responses didn't differ based on whether you're fall versus spring. It just was slightly higher on average for all nitrogen rates or in the, with the fall application. Then for the source trial, I mean, we saw the same thing, um, you know, it's rough, well, although it was actually a little bit different because we saw the recoverable sucrose per acre was roughly 3% greater with the spring application. This was mainly due to some differences we saw in tonnage. Um, it didn't, wasn't really picked up um, within the yield data, but if you factored in both the, um, the extractable sucrose as percentage with the, the tonnage, then it came out that it was slightly higher for the spring application for that 45 pound rate. And again, that's just one rate over that entire thing that we're looking at. Um, time of application, Hector, really not a lot of difference if you look at a recoverable sucrose. Uh, no N in, it, in urea had generally a greater recoverable sucrose. So when we applied it, generally it went down with, with the majority of the products. But again, kind of messy data, but something that we're looking at really over time is gonna be something that hopefully will shake out. So really we're looking at wrapping up. Um, we are looking at petiole nitrate concentrations. I showed some of this data last year um, when I compiled some of it about 850 ppm was a cutoff above that. We generally saw no increase in tonnage. Below that point, we're anywhere from about 40 to 100% in terms of tonnage. So if you're looking at a critical level right now, that's kind of the cutoff value, but again, we'll be evaluating that with, with newer data. Fall and spring, they're equally as effective, although 2021 was a dry year and we'll kind of see what happens. I'm hoping we get a wet year in, in one of these years just to kind of look at a comparison because that's kind of where things really tended to fall apart with the fall application. And hopefully that'll help us um, kind of sort out between some of the sources. End rate response, we'll continue to compile data, but right, it's kind of where we're at. 130 at the one site was kind of where we're at. Crookston, there was just no response with the lower yield potential. And again, this, the source data, the jury's out on that right now. So hopefully, you know, as you know, a few years of it continues to get funded, we'll have some additional data on that moving forward. So again, with that, I wanna thank um, you for your time today and then the r &E board for um, sponsoring this trial. Thank you, Dr. Kaiser. Our next presentation 
titled Strip Till and Cover Crops Before Planting Sugar Beets. Jody DeYoung Hughes will be the presenter from the University of Minnesota. Okay. So what we did, um, this took a little bit longer than we thought because we picked out three locations. We had them um, in Southern Mim, and we had Brian uh, Ryberg and Noah Holtgren and uh, Warren, Wayne Formal. And so what we looked at is what we did with the corn the year before, did it affect the beets the next year? So we stripped till before beets, we put down cover crops in the corn, some of them came in early, like we planted them when they were about, corn was maybe V4 around in there. And then uh, late, so could we plant them? Um, well, we had to plant them by drum because I couldn't get the haggy that I really wanted. Okay, so we looked at that um, in 2019, couldn't do it, to, uh, it was so wet. And I couldn't use a plane, that would have been great for cover crops, right? A wet fall but I couldn't use a plane because the way that our strips were lined up, the plane would have put cover crops across everything. And I needed the control that had no cover crops in it. And then, um, so then we finally got in in 2020 for the corn and we interseeded and we used crimson clover and annual rye. And I'll go through this part a little quick because it has been reported on. Um, all the cover crops came up and that was awesome. And then at Ryberger's farm since, it's really hard to get a strip tiller to uh, put a chisel plow or a disc back into his field after he's already built up his soil structure. So instead he looked at broadcasting the cover crops versus using a drill for early season cover crops. And then we uh, got a Rantizo Joan. I will not put up the economics to this because $150 an hour and they can't, <laughs> and they can't do very many acres and they had to go over the acre two to three times depending on our rate. Right now is not feasible for farmers to do, but we got down almost 60 pounds of cereal rye. And then um, the cover crops did survive from the late season. From the early season cover crops, they seemed to pitter out, but the late season did come back up in the spring, but it was really blotchy. Uh, we also got down all of our treatments in that year, which was great. Uh, one of them did take a little bit longer. You can see that we had snow, but you remember we had that early snow and then it was really fantastic out again. So we were able to get them all in. And then uh, this spring we went out and took stand counts and basically no difference in any of the stand counts. There was differences between each field, what their stands were, but not within. Um, I was concerned because I like when people first start strip till that they do a secondary pass in the spring that they kind of um, just fluff up that soil and really make sure that berm is a really good spot for a very small uh, sugar beet seed to be planted into it. But, uh, you know, time just goes by so quick, you can't always get that done. So I was a little concerned that we were going to have issues with these plots because they didn't do a secondary pass. I did notice when we were planting that um, at a couple of the places, we did hairpin a lot of corn residue in where the beets were growing. And this year got dry really quick. And I was really worried about that uh, residue in there because it would have made it much drier because bulk density is different between soil and residue. So what we found here in, in the stand counts is that we didn't have any differences here. Oops, my last one. Oh, I'm sorry, that was residue counts. There are differences in residue counts. What we found is that if you did um, tillage there that you were down around, well, 30, 39% residue, which isn't too bad, but we'd like to see a little bit more. And then if you did strip till, you were um, more around 60 to 70. Now, the reason why, do I get this one here? Um, because uh, Wayne was able to do a little secondary pass and it did much more tillage, but he had all that residue there over the winter time to protect the soil. So it went down to 50%, which is still a really great number. And then when we looked at stand counts, there was no difference again. You can see the averages with strip till. We looked at, I didn't keep the strip till early uh, cover crops. One of the reasons why is none of the cover crops really, they didn't come back in the spring. So I knew they weren't going to affect anything. And two, it was 102 de degrees that day. And I'm sorry, I'm a wuss. And there was only so many sand counts I was going to take out there. So we, I know, 
it's sad. When you get older, you'll understand. So with this, we see that they're all basically very, very similar across that. Now, why do we do stats? I know most of you guys are pretty good about this, but the reason why we do stats is because of field variability. All of these plots were field length and they were fairly flat fields with maybe a little hill in the middle, not much, but the variability out there is going to be huge. So when you look at your combine and you see your yield maps out there, you and you did everything the same to that field, right? You did um, the same hybrid, same fertilizer, same everything. And you still get a map that looks like this, right? That your yields are up and down and up and down. And that's the natural variability of the field. What statistics does, and this is a simplified definition, is that it takes out the background variability and helps you look at more of just what that treatment was. Was it tillage? Was it the fertilizer? Was it you know, the herbicide out there? and takes out that background information. That's why stats are important. And so when they talk about that you can have big variability out there, it's the field that's doing it. And so we wanna you know, kind of get that out of there and figure out what really helped out there. So we went and hand harvested 10 foot of rows, six times per treatment, the three treatments and the three reps at each field. And um, we came up with 54 samples per, uh, field. And um, when you saw Aaron's talk, he showed you the big black bags that we carried around and everything. And uh, we had a crew for one of the fields, which was awesome. And what we found out is that the sugar beet tons per acre did not vary. So if you look across there and you see the little whiskers, if they're within that area, they're the, these are all the same. These are all the same. And these are all the same. Now across fields, one, two, and three, there were differences, but that makes sense. These guys were by Granite Falls, Winthrop, and Danvers. So very different soil conditions and things like that. Um, but within just the tonnage, really no difference. Uh, percent sugar per acre, again, no difference. There was differences across fields, but not in the field. Again, so if you're looking at the green, that's strip till. I can't get my little mouse. There we go. And this was um, like Brian had the, the one that was a little different. This was um, his broadcast cover crop one. And then the purple is putting in cover crops late into the corn, had no effect on yield and beets the next year. And then again, if you look at disc grip versus strip till and strip till that had late, again, covers the year before, no difference between them. And I was, like I said, I was worried because there was a lot of hair pinning, but those beets really did outgrow it. So you can see in this field here, you can see the old residue and very splotchy rye. That's kind of what we got on this one. And then extractable sugar, again, no difference, only between fields. And so the summary is that we looked at all the things that you can um, do for beets. And what we found out is tons per acre, percent sugar, percent extractable sugar, extractable sugar per ton per acre, sugar per acre and purity were all the same. Just the fields were separate. And I still am of the mindset that if you're used to tillage, that that little secondary pass in the spring might make you feel a little bit better, but definitely get out from behind the planter and see what's going on out there. We did that quite a few times. And I wanna thank the guys that were my cooperating farmers and David Mettler and the board, thank you very much. And uh, Carson, he helped bring us in a strip tiller, or yeah, he got a strip tiller in one location and he also got us the interseeder for cover crops. Anna Cates to help me with the statistics and Dorian that uh, was out there hand harvesting with me. And um, the reason why I'm not putting in for another grant this year is because hand harvesting's a bear. <laughs> No, if I do, I'm, I'm, I learned a lot. The biggest thing is to find a, a field that will go to a, a piler that has the electronic tickets. Then, then I'm on board. And then I had a lot of people help from soil and water. They helped out too. So um, in case you're interested about compaction, there is a compaction conference coming up. It's virtual in, uh, in a couple of weeks. And um, we have people from Sweden and the US and Canada speaking on this. But any questions about the thing? Basically, we found that 
strip till and um, disc ripping did the same thing. And if you look at, if you have the same yields and sugar, then you look at the cost of doing that tillage. And if you're doing two passes, one with a disc ripper and then a field cultivator in the spring, that's two passes versus strip till that is one. Um, if you do a freshening pass, you can go about 10 miles an hour. So that would cost you less on that one too. Our next speaker this afternoon, uh, presentation is titled CRISPR-based next generation diagnostic method development to evaluate beet necrotic yellow vein virus causing rhizomanian sugar beet. Dr. Vanitha Ramachandran from the USDA ARS here in Fargo. Thank you, Mark. Uh, uh, good afternoon. Uh, again, I'm Vanitha Ramachandran and sugar beet virologist with the USDA ARS located at Fargo. And today I'll be discussing about a technology that's a CRISPR-based detection method that we developed at the USDA for detecting beet necrotic LOA virus, which is the causative of rhizomania. So since the discovery of CRISPR-Cas system, it's been widely used for gene editing for trait development in plants. However, scientists have uh, kind of tweaked the technology depending on the presence of many different CRISPR and Cas versions. It has been tweaked to uh, be utilized for detecting viruses, and we have used that technology to develop one for detecting BNYDB. And I would like to thank the um, research and uh, development board for uh, funding this project. So today my talk covers two topics. Number one is the rhizomania survey that we have done for the year 2021. And the second part of my talk would be about the technology that we developed for detecting BNYBV. So if we look at the diseases and sugar beet productivity across the United States, there are several different diseases that affect the productivity of the sugar beet. And among those, I do care about rhizomania and uh, the disease causes a crazy root with the many different phenotypes and drastically affect the productivity of the sugar beet. And across the nation, there are many different states that produce the sugar beet. And among those, the cumulatively, the Minnesota and North Dakota are the major producers of sugar beet. So this slide shows an overview of uh, um, rhizomania. So on the right side, it shows the aerial view of the rhizomania. If the field has the rhizomania, you can see the yellow stripes. And the second one, so here you could see the ground view, the yellow necrotic uh, symptomatic plants. And here shows the uh, an individual plant with the blinker type of phenotype. And here is the typical rhizomania hairy root disease, if the disease exists in in sugar beet. And the disease is primarily caused by beet necrotic LOA virus, which is composed of four to five uh, different components of RNA. It's an RNA virus. So if we look at the disease management, genetic resistance is the mainly, um, the, it is the only cost-effective control measures that we use. And it's, I don't need to emphasize this for this audience, it started with RZ1 and then RZ2, and then now we have an introgressed RZ1, RZ2 genotypes that could, in fact, manage the disease. And there is no any registered chemical treatments that are available uh, up in the market to be used for this disease. And yet another posing threat is the appearance of resistance breaking strains of the virus. So that's why because of the genetic resistance based management, the diagnosis of the virus plays an important role, both field soil evaluation and also plant evaluations for variety selection. Rhizomania, based on the history, it's been called as a sleeping giant. I think like it is true because this year, 2021, 
we do got this kind this is just representative of many different beats that we got from different parts of the um, field stations across Minnesota and North Dakota. And we do see, we saw uh, this is a healthy sugar beet versus the hairy root, typical rhizomania phenotypic sugar beet. And here is another uh, kind of worst hairy root type phenotypic sugar beet that we encountered in the field. So the first part is about sugar beet survey. So we got just the beet by itself and also the soil uh, corresponding to the beet locations and uh, five or six different cooperatives, American Crystal Sugar, Mindac Farmers Cooperative, Southern Minnesota Beet Sugar Cooperative and Sprickle Sugar and Amalgamated Sugar Company from Idaho. And we got both, like I said, beet sample by itself and also the corresponding soil samples. And we do have a pipeline to detect both the soil samples and the beet samples. And the, for the beet samples, we scrape the roots carefully around the, the, the symptomatic uh, root area. And then we do an ELISA assay. And whatever, if you see LO, that means BNY may be positive. If you see a no color, that means it's, it's negative for BNYVV. And for the soil samples, we get the soil and then we do a soil bathing assay and then take the root and go through the ELISA process. So uh, in the virology lab, we have two meticulous uh, technical uh, people, Eric Santiago Rivera, he's an USD employee and I do have Hunter Bath from NDSU student. They both are very meticulous in conducting this assay for the field survey. Just I'll quickly go through this. So this is these are the beet samples that we got from Mintac um, uh, Station near the Peak Piling Station, Minnesota. So we got about seven beet samples, and each one is individually assayed by ELISA to take a look at the BNYVE as a measure of rhizomania here. And this yellow line is the threshold. So anything above is considered positive, anything below is considered negative. And we do have a positive internal control. That's this one to make sure that the assay is done and it works. And among these seven tested, uh, two of them kind of looks like rhizomania positive based on the ELISA data. But we did not get soil for this station. And the next one is for American Crystal Sugar. It's a wheatland, North Dakota. And we got about 10 beet samples and we, we saw typical rhizomania type phenotype on these big samples. However, our ELISA data turns out to be negative for all the 10 tested big samples. And we do got, we do get um, soil samples and uh, the soil samples were tested using three different um, sugar big genotypes susceptible RZ1 and RZ1 and 2 together. And that is indicated the three different colors here, none of them were above the threshold. So they all remain negative for uh, B and Y B. However, with the another station, the SAM in Minnesota for the American crystal sugar, so we got about 20, 21 samples, beet samples, and the two different soil samples. The beet samples, some of them turned out to be positive for rhizomania B and Y B B, but the soil sample most likely remain negative except the susceptible one. So in this case, there is a discrepancy between the beet sample versus the soil sample. So there could be many different reasons why this is, um, it's giving a different data. We are currently repeating the assay to make sure this, we are getting the same results. And this is for um, SMBSC. So we we uh, surveyed three different locations, and this is for Melbourne 24, Minnesota, and we got 14 sample beet samples, and some of them were positive, others were negative. However, the soil sample remained negative for BNYBB. And uh, this is for Melville 11. We got just two beet samples. Um, they both turned out to be negative for uh, rhizomania and the soil sample also remain negative, which is a very tight correlation here that we found. And this is for Woods 20, again, SMBSC, and some beets 
uh, turned out to be positive, others were negative, but the soil sample remained negative. Like I said, there is a discrepancy here, so we are repeating the assay uh, and to see that um, whether we get the same data. So the next topic is about uh, the CRISPR assay that we developed for detecting V and YVV. So why we are interested in CRISPR assay and why did we develop, I just go through in my next few slides. So as a virologist, we are looking for an assay which can be specific and highly sensitive and you know, uh, isothermal and rapid, fast effective as so many different factors. So currently we use ELISA, which is a protein-based assay and the specificity, it has its own limitation on, in terms of specificity. And we could do qPCR, which is quantitative real-time PCR, which is expensive and uh, it's not isothermal. On the other hand, the CRISPR-based technology is um, sensitive and specific like Q qPCR and it can be portable. So eventually the technology can be developed into a kind of like strict based assay which is totally, which will be totally field deployable. So that's the advantage of using this technology and why we are interested in developing the technology. This slide shows an overview of the details of the technology. So basically BNYVV is an RNA genome. So first we turn that into an isothermal DNA uh, part and then you add the CRISPR, the CAS, all the reagents necessary for the CRISPR based detection and put all the reagents together. Then every, everything is together, a biochemical reaction takes place and that emits a signal which is read by a, a plate reader. So like I said, the justification for why we are developing this technology, would it be much better than other existing technologies? So if you look at the um, existing ELISA-based technology, which is used for BNYVB, so let's say we have a white BNYVB, which is blue in color, and then we have a re resistant breaking variant of the BNYVB. So the resistant breaking region is, is just depicted here as a red spot. So in this case, for the ELISA, both RNA particles will be uh, coated or uh, when it forms a virus particle, it is it, it, it just coated by the same protein, coat protein. So when ELISA is done, the ELISA technology cannot differentiate the white virus, virus versus the resistant breaking virus. So that, that's the limitation exists there. But in the case of CRISPR-based technology, the guide RNA, which is here, so if it's a wild type, one can design a guide RNA just to target the wild type. If it's a resistant breaking strain with the, with the known sequence variant, then one can uh, design a guide RNA, which is indicated in the red here, and then that will just detect the resistant breaking strain. So that's the advantage that we, that, that, that is coming with the CRISPR-based technology and why we are interested in developing this technology. So to begin with, we just started developing a white type detection technology based on CRISPR. So we got the soil and we did the soil weighting assay and the soil was, the weighting assay was verified by the, for the presence of BNYVV by ELISA. And then we did the isothermal amplification, which is a prerequisite for CRISPR. And we could see a very nice isothermal amplification of the BNYVV. And this was for the sequence confirmed to make sure that it is really representing the BNYVV. So the next step is the CRISPR technology. So all that you wanted to look at is the orange one is the, the infected sample, um, rhizomania containing sample versus the blue one is the healthy sample. So 10 nanogram of total RNA is more than enough to uh, dramatically differentiate the healthy versus the infected sample. And then we just diluted 10 folds across the board and then it shows that 0 0.1 nanogram is um, the, the technology uh, is sensitive up to 0 0.1 nanogram. And with that, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Melvin Bolton, the research leader of our unit for his continuous support and providing appropriate resources. 
and the sugar beet virology team, Eric and Hunter, they are very meticulous in conducting the experiments and the lab members of the Bolton lab, Dr. John Weiland has been very helpful in terms of teaching me the rhizomania and field visit and everything. And I would like to thank our industry collaborators and funding support from USDA. And for this particular project, I again thank the uh, Sugar Beet Research and Education Board for funding and the Beet Sugar Development Foundation. With that, I thank and like to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Ramchandran. Our next presentation is Understanding and Managing Plant Pathogens Causing Post-Harvest Losses in Sugar Beet in North Dakota and Minnesota. Dr. Shim Kondal, the USDA ARS here in Fargo. Thank you, Mark. Um, I am one of the newest uh, editions uh, in our research unit uh, uh, of uh, sugar beet and potato uh, research uh, here in uh, Fargo, North Dakota. Uh, uh, in my position, I have been little over uh, three months. Um, today, I am going to briefly uh, talk about uh, uh, my research uh, program, uh, including uh, uh, ongoing research and uh, uh, the research plan for the near future. Uh, so I am about post-harvest uh, pathology and storage disease in a uh, uh, sugar beet. Um, the uh, first objective of my ongoing research is uh, to understand the uh, uh, incidence and uh, severity of uh, post-harvest pathogen uh, in storage piles. Um, I am uh, planning to collect the samples, uh, uh, hopefully covering from all um, uh, factory districts in the Red River Valley. Uh, the second objective of my uh, research is uh, to estimate the impact of these uh, post-harvest pathogen um, on storage properties of uh, uh, sugar beet, uh, including uh, respiration rate, uh, sucrose loss, uh, and uh, uh, invert uh, sugar concentration. Uh, here in this slide, um, I would like to share my thoughts about uh, uh, storage disease uh, uh, in uh, uh, sugar beet piles. Um, uh, as you see here uh, in this cartoon, uh, these are the uh, uh, complex uh, microbial communities, um, uh, including inoculum of root pathogen. Um, they are uh, present in the uh, rhizosphere soil uh, as well as in uh, roots. Uh, uh, Pre-harvest population of these uh, uh, microbial communities uh, in the sugar beet uh, uh, production field uh, can carry over uh, in storage piles uh, with the uh, roots uh, and the uh, dirt uh, uh, that's on the roots uh, during harvesting. And uh, as you see here, this is the uh, a, a huge storage pile and uh, these roots in uh, storage piles are still live and uh, they continue to do respiration and uh, respiration uh, increase the uh, uh, temperature uh, inside the pile. Um, uh, that uh, increasing temperature uh, uh, can uh, uh, result in uh, excessive mi microbial growth. Uh, these uh, microbial growth uh, can cause uh, 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 severe rotting, uh, causing uh, 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 big uh, post-harvest uh, losses. Uh, also, uh, uh, wounded or injured uh, uh, sites in uh, roots uh, can provide uh, plant pathogen uh, uh, to direct as access to internal root tissues, uh, uh, which would also uh, increase the incidence of storage disease. Um, I have started uh, uh, collecting samples uh, from the storage piles um, uh, uh, from the region. Uh, here, um, I'm showing these sugar beet roots um, infested with these uh, different uh, 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 microbial uh, infestation. Uh, uh, we uh, collected uh, uh, soils, I'm sorry, uh, sugar beet samples uh, from uh, three different locations. Uh, uh, top, middle, and the bottom location of these piles. Uh, and uh, um, at the time of sampling, um, these roots were stored about uh, one and a half month. Uh, and we already started to see these uh, uh, microbial growth. 
Um, and we also followed up our sampling a week later, um, and uh, we also collected um, the samples uh, uh, in the same way that we collected for the first time. Um, this time, we also uh, uh, see those uh, microbial growth. Uh, in addition to that, this time we saw a few sprouting as well. As you see here, the, these are the sprouting uh, from the roots. Uh, and uh, it will be very interesting to explore uh, uh, this uh, research as well. Is, uh, is there any direct connection between um, sprouting and the storage loss uh, in the pile? Um, I am planning to collect uh, samples uh, through this winter and spring, um, hopefully from a, a different um, a sugar district. I am um, also interested uh, to develop the research project um, to study a soil and a root microbiomes uh, using the metagenomics approach. Um, these studies will uh, give uh, some insight about the uh, microbial population in uh, roots uh, and the soil under pre-harvest condition. Uh, most uh, common uh, pathogens uh, from these studies uh, will be characterized and uh, hopefully we will uh, generate uh, some uh, resources that we can explore more uh, to develop the uh, diagnostic tools uh, to detect this post-harvest post -harvest pathogen early on. Uh, I'm also interested uh, in exploring uh, the studies related to the uh, genetics of plant pathogen interaction uh, using the rna seq approach. And uh, these studies uh, will uh, uh, give, uh, give us some idea about the candidate genes uh, uh, which are active uh, during compatible and incompatible host pathogen interactions. Um, I am also planning to do uh, some research um, to explore the mitigation strategies uh, for these uh, storage disease uh, uh, by evaluating the host resistance uh, and uh, some other substances, uh, including fungicide. With that, um, I uh, I like to, I would like to appreciate uh, the support and the encouragement uh, from our um, stakeholders and the industry partners. Uh, uh, this is my contact information. Uh, please uh, uh, give me a call or, or send me an email. I am happy to chat with you. As, as I told you before, I'm still new here. Uh, I'm still learning about the sugar beet, um, and I'm very happy to. Um, chat with you, interact with you. Um, um, yep. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Kandel. Our final presentation today, titled uh, Progress Towards an Improved Disease Forecasting Model for Circas Relief Spot by Dr. Nathan Wyatt, the USDA ARS here in Fargo. Well, hi, everybody. Um, my name is Nate Wyatt, and I'm the new research plant, path, research plant pathologist at the USDA ARS here. Um, I got started about mid-August, and so today I want to give you a brief update on what my research program will focus on, um, as well as give you some preliminary data onto some of the um, corollary weather data we have that we're going to use to inform the disease forecasting model going forward. Um, so a general project overview for my lab. Um, some of the things we intend to work on first and foremost is um, tracking Cercospora baticula adaptation to CR plus sugar var varieties over the course of um, the next few years. We have isolates collected and sequenced from 2020. 2021 is on its way, and we will continue collections in 2022. Um, and these will be put into a genome-wide association study um, in order to find genomic loci in the pathogen that are contributing to the adaptation to this new selection pressure we're putting on it. Um, along those same lines, uh, we'll be doing uh, work with fungicides and GWAS as well. Um, we've been doing a little bit of work looking at fungicide cross resistance with the DMIs right now. Um, we intend to do some Cercospora baticula epigenetics um, in order to look at epigenetic responses to fungicide treatments as well. Um, and we also intend to utilize all the isolates we collect in order to do some genome wide association mapping for um, tin resistance, uh, DMI resistance, and as many fungicides as we can get reliable phenotyping for. Um, furthermore, we're gonna uh, utilize a global and a temporal population that Gary Secor has 
Um, so Gary has this large global collection of Cercospora isolates that we're going to sequence and that's going to allow us to get a really good idea of the diversity and the genetic potential of this pathogen across the globe. Um, and then he also has another fantastic population that's a set of isolates collected each year starting in 1998. And with a population like that, we'll be able to track the um, genetic responses of the pathogen to different management practices over the course of time. So I know you've all seen the map of tin resistance waxing and waning as its usage comes and goes. Um, and we'll be able to track trends like that across the pathogen populations and figure out how that's um, being facilitated. Um, and then we're gonna use as much of that information as well as a lot of the weather data we have to inform our disease forecasting model and adjust that model. Right now, our forecasting model is really based off of uh, daily infection values, which are largely based off of uh, temperature and relative humidity over a set amount of time. And we really need to incorporate more information in that model in order to be more specific about when we apply our fungicides or when risk really is being assessed. Um, so a, a general timeline of CLS, um, the disease cycle over the course of the year. So we have planting and I put March, April on here, but I've been informed that's probably a little later than that. Um, we know that by, uh, in 2021, as of June 17th, we had detected latent Cercospora baticula infection in asymptomatic sugar beet leaves. Um, we know that roughly June, July, we get first spots observed and daily infection values start to spike where we know that we're at risk for um, CLS. And then fungicide control really begins there with multiple cycles of C. baticula going through its sporulation life cycle during that time as well. And that leads all the way up to harvest. But we don't have a ton of information in this early section about the early pathogen biology. And this is a region where um, Gary Secor and Viviana have been able to um, uncover a couple aspects of the pathogens biology that I think are important to account for moving forward. Um, so just as a refresher for Viv's presentation earlier, she was able to identify this crucial, um, essentially leaf wetness period um, of four hours. And then Gary also this year had spore traps out um, in three different locations in Oxbow, Purley, and Renville. Um, and he was monitoring weather data as well as trapping spores. Um, a key finding of this research was that they were able to find um, QOI resistant fungus or QOI resistant isolates as early as May 3rd. Um, and he was generous enough to hand me off the weather data so that I could do some correlations with what specific weather data would be most conducive for that four hour leaf wetness period. Um, and so I took the leaf wetness data, just grafted over time. Um, and I have on there when spores were initially detected and when latent infection was detected. And you can see on here, if you can see this cursor at all, there's a few spikes in here where leaf wetness really takes off. Um, now, knowing that leaf wetness sensors are finicky, and this is a difficult phenotype and difficult data to really rely on. I took all of the leaf wetness data that you see throughout this chart, and then I used that
Thank you all for staying to the end. Uh, we'd like to also indicate to you, those of us who are here, we had about 150 of our colleagues online, a number of our colleagues from Shakopee, Margaret and her group, uh, Jamie and his group from New Zealand. Uh, they are Tuesday morning, I think four or five o'clock. Still good to have you here with us, Jamie. Um, we have some of our colleagues from Sydney, Bart, Stephen and company. Uh, a lot of the uh, seed company reps over in Europe, uh, Jamie, and some in Switzerland. Good evening. It's pretty late over there. And um, Anne Elizabeth, thank you for staying all the way through. So all our colleagues over in Europe, Anja, and your colleagues over in uh, Serbia, I hope you had a good program. You asked for this last year. And we have um, managed, with the help of Scott and others, uh, Mark, Tom, and others to kind of get this done. I, I would like to again thank the RNE board and the growers for your commit, commitment to uh, taking money from your uh, pocket, putting it into a checkoff, and seeing the rewards of it. Agricultural research does pay off. The return on investment is very, very high. Somebody said over 40%. You don't get it from the bank these days. Thank to Mr. Shigeki and Sumitomo for providing lunch. Thanks to all my co colleagues from the co-ops, Todd, Mike Metzger, um, Mark Blumquist, and others. With that there, I would like to say thank you. Uh, stick around if you want further discussions. And we still have some uh, at least some soda at the back. Have a good evening. Thank you all for coming.